The Dauntless. The dinner was amazing. Main course had been skewers with each one being a different kind of meat and all of them with a hint of spices. Not enough to burn or hurt, but enough to make the taste exotic. On the job or not, this has been the best birthday Jadza can remember. The dessert is simple, but so elegantly displayed that she was almost reluctant to eat. The fruit arrangement was more of an art piece than food. She catches herself leaning heavily into Modan more than once. The adorable man is as solid as Hypercrete physically, but his personality is more akin to a down-stuffed pillow. Exactly like the very pillow she found the information about his amazing evening on. But all good things must come to an end and she, to her regret, is informed that the dining experience is ended and that the staff invite her and her companion back at a later date. Taking the obvious hint that it's time to leave, she rises up and is joined by Modan. She notes that part of her team is waiting to be seated in the front area, and they're both surreptitiously followed out. Hmm. I'm not sure I want the night to end. It's been so wonderful so far. Well, I have all of tomorrow open, so there's no concern about bedtimes from me, Modan says, and she smiles. Really? Well, in that. She's cut off as a cold wind sweeps through the darkening city. Her dress may be beautiful, but it's not the warmest. In moments, Moden's jacket is off and draped around her shoulders. Oh, you don't have to do that. I'll be fine, she insists while inwardly she wants to keep the jacket permanently. Oh, don't worry. I've got the full protection. I could stand naked on a glacier and the only issue would be public indecency. Modan notes and her mind instantly places the man on a towering peak of ice and snow stark naked and twisting in the wind. Wind in reality and freezing environment of her imagination be damned, she starts heating up. He hums ever so slightly as he rolls up his sleeves. So, is there any place you'd like to go? Her apartment. But it's not, actually. Maybe it's time to exercise a bit of power. Oh, the local gardens are lovely with night-blooming flowers. Would you care to see, she asks. I'd be delighted, he says, and her heart flutters a bit. He switches so easily from adorable and awkward to charming and suave with no real rhyme or reason that she can't get used to either. The nighttime garden is as beautiful as ever, perhaps even more so with a towering monolith of a man by her side. With his sleeves rolled up and jacket off, it's clearer than ever just how well put together Modan is. The man was carved for a dream of purest beauty, and the night breeze shows there is no padding on his large frame. She surreptitiously types out a message on her phone and gives the order for her apartment to be cleaned. There's a response and she has to insist to get things moving. Now, if only there wasn't any interruptions. But it's not like she can ask for a public place to be devoid of the public now, can she? So, I've been informed a fair amount about Yaoya culture. When it comes to the honor blades, it usually has to be forged after a great hunt, right? Right. Is there something wrong with that? She asks. No, I'm just wondering if you perhaps have a story for me. I don't see you wearing a blade, but... Modan asks even as they pass by a woman examining some of the flowers in a hooded jacket. Oh, perfect. Your credits or your life? The woman states and they both turn to find that they're all but looking down the barrel of a loudly humming Dake Tech plasma gun. Then, in an instant, there's a sudden movement from Modan, and the woman yelps in shock as he rips the still powering up gun out of her hand and points it at her, just in time for it to finish charging. An excellent idea. Your wallet, now. Modan states in a tone of tightly controlled fury as he completely reverses the mugging. You have very fast hands. Jadza compliments him, even as she returns her plasma pistol to its hidden state. Thank you. It took a while to train that technique, he notes. Could you please call the police? I think they'd like to speak with this woman. Of course, I'll get right on that, 
she says before making a quick call and telling the dispatcher everything in proper shorthand police code. They'll be here in about five minutes. Tell me though, I've heard rumors that humans are rather loot happy when it comes to vanquished opponents. Is that going to cause a problem with turning over evidence? While it would be nice to keep this weapon, I'm not going to argue or refuse to turn it over as evidence, but I will make a polite inquiry. Why though? Surely you have better ones back on your ship, she asks him. Ah, but I haven't effortlessly reversed a mugging while on a lovely date with those weapons. Which makes this one special now, doesn't it? He asks, before giving the girl a glare. And where do you think you're going, miss? There's a tap on his shoulder and he tilts his head somewhat to regard the person he did not sense approach right behind him. Yes? You are of the undaunted, are you not? She asks. I am, he replies. Very good. Prepare yourself. We will be doing battle shortly. She states and he blinks. May I ask why? I am observing. The best method to observe someone is to engage them in noble battle. She answers. Who are you? He asks, even as Jadza receives an alert from her earpiece. Be very careful, girl. That's an empty hand, master. Her name is Mei Lan, daughter of Kai Lan. The whole family is forces of nature as far as the eye can see. Her handlers call out in a panic. Now really isn't the time, madam. I'm in the middle of a date, he says, and Mei Lan blinks and regards them. Really? I apologize for my assumptions. Will you be free for mortal combat tomorrow? Mei Lan asks, and Modan is confused and looks towards Jadza for guidance. Perhaps the day after. I've been hoping for... Well, I assume a smart woman can put things together. Jadza answers and Mei Lan sighs somewhat. Very well. I shall see you the day after tomorrow. Prepare for battle. She states and then with barely a move rockets upwards and there's a slight flicker of the dimmed lights far overhead to let them know that she had impacted the roof some hundred stories above them. Well, that's going to be interesting. Modan notes as he's clearly thinking. Hey, don't think I forgot about you. No squirming away. The mugger freezes again as her attempt to escape is aborted. Aren't you worried about an empty hand master demanding to fight you? She wants to fight me for a test, not to kill me. It'll hurt, likely a lot, but it won't kill me. Modan states calmly. Are you sure? Jadza asks. Reasonably, he states. Reasonably? She asks. Life has risk inherent to it. I don't know for certain, he says, even as the familiar flashing lights of a police cruiser start to flicker into the area. Hmm, they're here sooner than expected. Thankfully, the police are understanding and Moden hands over the weapon without even a hint of fuss. Well, now that that's out of the way, shall we continue? He asks her and she blinks. Just like that? It doesn't bother you? You were just in a mugging and an empty hand master wants to fight you. Not one of us that left our home world expected things to turn out so well. Even if Miss Lan bounces me off every level of every spire on Centris, it's still a better result than some of our worst predictions. Believe me, I was very happy to lose several bets. You thought things would turn out badly? She asks him. I had no idea what to think, but the very idea that the galaxy operated under an entirely different set of physics meant that things were going to be very different. And they are, but also not. It's all much closer and much more reasonable than I feared. He admits before chuckling. I suppose that's another reason why I've been so reluctant to leave the ship before now. Not only is there always more work to do, but I'm kind of ashamed for thinking so poorly of the galaxy. I'm glad to have been proven so wrong. I see. Tell me, though. What plans do you have for later? She asks, and he gives her a questioning look. I mean, as in the next few years, not later tonight. Hmm? The next few years? He mutters before shrugging. To be honest, I've just been going with the flow. 
the realization that agelessness is possible, that there's so much to learn and do, that there's so much to see and overcome. I'm a little overwhelmed. I'll just be my best self and see where it takes me. I've been getting stronger in the gym, mastering more and more of my axiom abilities and helped even pioneer a few techniques and tricks that have helped my fellow undaunted. That has to count for something. I'd like to think it does. She adds and the spy instincts niggle just a little so she pokes. What did you help them create? Oh, the defensive brand, he explains before unbuttoning his vest and then shirt to her shock. He shucks his outfit partially off and when she can take her eyes off the massively well-defined muscles on his torso that she can now plainly see outlined by his stark white undershirt, she notices a pattern on his left shoulder. It's proof against most thermal attacks. It prevents gas attacks and even damage from very long falls. Unfortunately, there's no real way to defend against kinetic attacks without the brand becoming a hindrance. But it's already saved lives and some of my more enthusiastic researchers have had all kinds of fun with it. I was under the impression that Axiom brands hurt immensely, not that there's anything fun about it. Unless one is an extreme masochist. In which case, in which case, Mr. Sweet and Innocent here might be too much for her. Oh, applying the brand does indeed hurt immensely. There's no doubt about that, he says, buttoning back up and hiding those incredibly well-formed pectorals. But it's considered worth the price, especially when it reduces the damage of a plasma sword into little more than a mild annoyance. Really? That's quite powerful, which means it would have hurt even more. Jadza remarks and he shrugs. Yes, yes it did. However pain fades and the gains last for a lifetime if you're willing to work on it. He remarks before sighing and looks very disappointed in himself. And I just quoted a jock, oh my goodness. A jock? Someone more concerned with physical pursuits than intellectual ones, characterized by being strong but simple. He says before sighing again. And I just quoted one. I've shamed my family. The rueful grin on his face assures her he's not being serious, but he had sounded so morose. There is a slight alert from her communicator and she glances at it. Her apartment is clean and ready. Good. Now she can stop stalling for time. Shamed them, have you? I doubt that. Wisdom can come from all sorts of places. She notes as she makes a point of pressing closer to him. Tell me. Would you be opposed to a slight change of location? To where, he asks, and she holds her hand out. My place, right now, she adds, and he holds up a finger and quickly brings out his communicator. I'm sending my car home on autopilot first. He states, and she nearly scoffs. It's, it's both completely on brand so far, yet mildly disappointing that he'd think of everything. It also implies that if he is being watched, then he's entirely unaware of it. After all, a good tail would take care of the car, as she trusts hers to do. He then takes her by the hand and she focuses on a familiar sensation. She doesn't teleport home often, but she'll make an exception. She's in a mood and wants him now. Not in 20 minutes, not even in 10, right now. Suddenly they're in the middle of the living room and she wraps her arms around his neck. Alone at last. Whatever he has to say is cut off as her lips meet his.